In the 1940s and 50s, Life magazine was among the world's most popular and influential publications. If you were a photographer, Valhalla on Earth was a job for life. Just ask Ed Clark, who was one of the chosen few. There were 36 staff photographers at Life. Uh, uh, once they got up to 36, that was a cutoff point. If somebody got killed, it was replaced. But that was about the only way that they left, and because uh, everybody wanted to work for Life magazine. The thing about Life was that if they hired you, they had all the confidence in the world in here, they wouldn't hire you. And once that you were hired, and you were in the field, they were not, Whatever you said what the situation was, whatever you needed, whatever, they took your word for it. And that's the way we operated. We could spend any amount of money for, you know, hire planes, boats, whatever we wanted to do to just get the picture. That's, the, that's all they cared, get the picture. Ed Clark got the pictures all over the country, all around the world, including early in his career one of the most famous photographs ever taken. When Roosevelt died, I was the nearest photographer to Warm Springs. And uh, they called and said, get to Warm Springs any way you can. So I just got in my car and drove all night to Warm Springs. And when I got there, uh, it was early in the morning. And uh, shortly after that, they started the caisson with the casket on it to the train. and. Uh, they lined up the photographers, and oh Lord, the photographers came from everywhere you can imagine. And uh, so I was standing behind a barrier. Secret Service herded you around just as though the president was still alive. And uh, I was behind the barrier, and I heard an accordion behind me start to play. And I turned around, and here's turned out to be Graham Jackson, who was a petty officer in the Navy, who had played many times for Roosevelt. And uh, he was playing uh, one of Roosevelt's favorite tunes, and the tears were streaming down his face. And I turned around and made just a few quick shots, hoping that none of the other photographers would notice, and they didn't. Still photographers, in my experience, and of course by reputation, are among the nastiest, meanest, toughest, right. <laughs> will stomp their grandmother into the ground for a picture and God help the person who gets in their way right. uh, at the time. You had a reputation of, of kind of, I guess, in contrast to that, being the nice guy who thereby got the picture. Well, uh, I did have that dubious distinction. <laughs> um, there used to be all sorts of tricks that the guys would play on each other. I've never heard of anybody uh, sabotaging equipment <laughs> in 30 years, or maybe 40 years, but it used to happen. I found that, uh, that uh, being considerate and uh, quiet, uh, I got a lot more done, I thought. That was my way of operating. In 1961, a cataract developing in his right eye signaled the end of Ed Clark's career with lens and shutter and the beginning of a 20-year hiatus from photography, during which he was very successful in the construction business, but he never forgot his first love. I replaced it with dreams. Um, for years and years and years, I dreamed photography. Uh, all the time I was a builder during that time, but I dreamed photography all the time. It was incredible. Night after night after night, I, I was either getting fired or hired, or I'd go out and do a story and it'd be a failure or a great success. I, I ran the gamut uh, in my dreams. That replaced it, I guess. He was too nearly blind to take pictures, but that never dampened the spirit of an old fire horse 
when a phone call brought news of the JFK assassination, reflexes took over. I just dropped the phone and came home and got my Leica, ran downtown, and I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I had to do, I had to do something. So um, uh, what I did, I, I went up to the Capitol, and they were lowering the flag at half-mast, and I shot it in color. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> I've shot the picture. Uh, there's, I don't have anybody to, uh, to give it to, to publish it. In 1982, he underwent eye surgery, and his real-life nightmare came to an end. Why I put off having the operation, I don't know. But I did. I put it off way too long. But when I finally did it, I got right in my car and went to New York and bought all new cameras and said, so I'm going to be a photographer again. Among his first pictures, a snapshot of a granddaughter that marked the return of Ed Clark, photographer. He now shoots freelance photos for stock libraries, and he shoots all the time. You got a lot of fancy stuff there. Come on this way. Let me get a picture of all this stuff. Yeah, sure. I do. I've just been seeing everything with new uh, eyesight, new vigor, and appreciating it a lot more. I think I'm a better photographer than I've ever been, if I've ever it was any good to begin with. If he ever was any good, mobster Mickey Cohen, framed by his own headlines. Candid portraits of the famous and the not so famous. A picture that spoke volumes about life in separate but unequal classrooms. How about casting once for me? Still very much the gentleman photographer he has a new dream now that's really an old dream recycled. He wants to take pictures again for Life magazine. Are you listening, Life? Ed Clark is back. <laughs>